This is a very quick run through of the new openprescribing.net service built by Anna Powell Smith and Ben Goldacre, that's me from the University of Oxford Evidence Based Medicine Data Lab. Open prescribing is a service that lets you look at what individual GP practices are prescribing. You can look at patterns over time, you can look at the data on a map, you can compare different practices against each other, you can see the data for clinical commissioning groups and so on. So let's look at some quick examples. Uh, first off, there are lots of different statins on the market. There's no evidence that statin is any better than any other statin, but it is much, much, much more expensive. So if we look at statin prescribing as a proportion of all statin prescribing, so as a proportion of all of the prescribing for that whole section of the BNF, we can see that there's a very, very wide range of variations. So some CCGs, we'll look at CCGs first, then practices. Some CCGs are 6% uh, of their prescribing is for statin, and for some it's only 0.6%. So we'd like to add funnel plots and scatter plots here. Uh, if you give us a little bit more money. Uh, so show on a map, you can see here who the biggest outliers. Darker means you spend more on statin as a proportion of all your lipid spend. It's always Shropshire, wherever you look. And show over time. So here, interestingly, you can see, this is dates back to 2013, because we're looking at CCGs, but we have data back to 2010 for individual practices. And you can see here that Hastings and Rother were big, big outliers for um, prescribing an awful lot of statin, And then they came down in about July 14. So let's have a look and see whether that was uh, all of the practices across the board or if it was just a couple of practices in that region that were driving it. And it looks like it was just a couple of practices. So you can see a couple of practices that were massive outliers, a quarter of all their uh, statin prescribing, more than a quarter, was for receiver statin. And they've mounted some kind of quality improvement project in June, July 2014, and massively, very, very suddenly brought it back down to be in line with the rest of the population. So that's an interesting example of using the site to look at whether people are effective or rather cost-effective prescribers. Um, next, uh, people get interested in antibiotics. It's one of the Chief Medical Officer's uh, major preoccupations. So let's say, uh, show me all antibiotic uh, prescribing, um, sorry, antibacterial is what it's called in BNF section. Uh, let's look at that. And for the denominator, let's take age and sex uh, corrected population for antibiotic use. You can read more about star PUs online. So here you can see actually much less variation if you just eyeball the spine chart there. Um, but uh, Oldham, bit of an outlier. You can have a look at Oldham if you like, separately as we did before. Um, more interestingly, you can also say, well, let's look at cephalosporin prescribing, because to use those in, sec in primary care is a little bit uh, odd. Again, as with all of these things, there might be good reason, but uh, it's interesting that the food for thought, if somebody is a big outlier, much broader variation there. Uh, again, we can look at it over time, we can show it on a map, we can drill down to individual practices if we want to. Uh, let's just go back to a blank analysis page and say, how about uh, chlorpromazine? So chlorpromazine is a very old fashioned antipsychotic drug. Um, and for denominator, we don't know, um, we, I think we probably wouldn't want to use um, local data on prevalence of psychosis. That would introduce all kinds of interesting complications, but as a proportion of all antipsychotic drug prescribing, it's interesting to look at chlorpromazine. Very old-fashioned, a lot of side effects, very cheap. And you can see here that some places, one in six of all the prescriptions they issue for antipsychotics uh, for chlorpromazine up in Halton, uh, whereas in most places it's much, much lower, and, and down here it's, it's um, only 1%. So let's have a little look at Halton. And here we go, NHS Halton. Let's look at the individual practices in Halton. And here you can see um, there are a few practices where a quarter, a th more than a third of all of their antipsychotic prescribing is for chlorpromazine. If we look on a map, it looks like they're all in roughly the same area. So perhaps this is a decision that's generally made in secondary care. So that means um, there's possibly a community mental health team doctor or doctors who are particularly keen on prescribing chlorpromazine. It may be that there is a particular, there's something odd about the patient population there where it is warranted to prescribe more chlorpromazine. It could be an effect purely due to chance random variation, but that's a very, very extreme um, quantity of chlorpromazine prescribing. So there may be a good reason or it may be an interesting signal to look at, or in any case, I think it's an interesting signal for people to look at and say, is anything odd going on here? And the issue is really, I think, that this stuff needs to be available to as many people as possible so that you get as many eyes as possible on the data. Now, we've got practice pages. So, for example, 
CCGs, you can look at uh, some standard indicators for a CCG. So I'm in Oxford right now. Oxfordshire CCG, we've got some standard indicators. So one is uh, Resuvastatin versus Atorvastatin prescribing. And here you can see that they're very, very good at using um, the cheaper of the two. Cerizet versus Desigestrel. So this is interesting. Um, this is the top of the NHS Business Service Authority's cost saving recommendations. They say you should use Desigestrel, which is generic version of exactly the same molecule. So over here we were looking at a different drug in the same class that's much cheaper and apparently equally effective. Here we're looking at exactly the same drug, but just in a branded and a generic version. So reasonably good. We'd like to get a little bit money, more money so we can add uh, confidence intervals and margins onto that. Um, if you want to get in touch, ben at badscience.net. Um, so here we can see cephalosporin prescribing. Their cephalosporin prescribing rates um, much, much lower than the rest of the country. Uh, antibiotic prescribing rates fairly similar to the rest of the country. Coxivs, pioglitazone, other indicators um, that we've just decided to look at. We'd like to build 100 indicators. There are so many more things that we'd like to put on here. And then, of course, individual practices. So let's say uh, Donington Health Centre, which is uh, just down the road from here. So here you can see, very good at uh, keeping receivers sat in prescribing costs down. Uh, Cerizet and desigestrel rates pretty much the same as the general population. Cephalosporin rates lower than everybody else. Uh, antibiotic rates similar to everybody else. Very good at not prescribing pioglitazone. So pioglitazone, interesting. Uh, rosiglitazone pretty much taken off the market now. It's an anti-diabetes drug and it's uh, got some unpleasant problems like it increases your risk of quite serious heart problems. Probably a class effect. So people stopped using pioglitazone across the board. You can see Donington Health Centre very, very suddenly stopped using pioglitazone. So that looks to me like somebody had a conversation. Let's not use pioglitazone anymore. Um, there are lots and lots of things we'd like to add onto this. We'd like to add alerts. So tell me if I go into the top or bottom 5% for any of your standard indicators. Tell me if you go into a, the top or bottom 5% um, of this particular uh, analysis that I've done on the page myself. So we'd like people to be able to just pop their email address in and get an alert if they become an outlier for any kind of prescribing pattern. Um, also, tell me if I slip across the centiles. So tell me if everybody else is getting much, uh, is it, if everybody else has suddenly stopped prescribing pioglitazone, own, but you carry on prescribing it at the same rate, um, then that's also a problem because it means that uh, your prescribing behaviour is changing relative to your peers. So we'd like to be able to send people alerts if they slip across the centiles. We'd like to be able to put nice confidence margins on that. We'd like to do file plots. There's a ton of stuff. So we built all of this for £50,000. It is open. It is free to everybody. We're very good at what we do. I think uh, we have delivered on time a fully functioning, serious big data project that that is free and open to absolutely everybody. We'd like to see this being used by doctors, by um, uh, practice managers, medicines management people, CCGs, commissioning support units, and so on. NHS England, Public England as well. We'd also like to see it used by patients and by local journalists or national journalists. I don't think that when somebody's an outlier for a prescribing practice, that necessarily means that they are definitely a bad prescriber. But it's an interesting starting point for having a look at whether there might be a problem with their prescribing. It's also a very good way of seeing who is uh, good at keeping up. So that is openprescribing.net. Thank you very much for your time. Get in touch. You can get me, ben at badscience.net, very easily. You can find me on Twitter. And we'd love it if you could use it. We'd love feedback. And if you're going to share it, please don't share it from any Twitter accounts with more than 2,000 followers at the moment until we move on to the super big, super powerful server and do all of the load testing for our formal launch. The site is currently in beta, but it's working and we love it.